Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to The Basics with Beth today. And I'm so glad you tuned in because we are digging in to God's Word together. And we're going on a journey. I'm taking you through, actually, I'm taking you through this book. It's called Getting a Grip on the Basics of Generous Living. And what that means is we're doing a line upon line study in God's Word, in a workbook, so you can fill in your own blanks and really get a hold of this study. I want to encourage you to get your own copy of the book at thebasicswithbeth.tv if you would like to have one. I would love for you to have this in your library and have it as a tool. And we're going to go through most of it. We're not hitting every single uh, fill in the blank, but we're hitting the high points because what we're doing is we're talking about God's plan for you and your finances in particular. What is God's will? What does his word say about his desire for you to increase in your income, in your wealth, in your generosity? In other words, we sometimes use the cliche phrase, you know, blessed to be a blessing. But actually, that's true. I mean, that really is what the Lord wants. And we're going to see it over and over and over. And especially in today's episode, we'll see that. And in order for us to really cooperate with God's economic laws and truly experience the Lord's blessing. You know, I mean, it's one thing for us to sort of bless ourselves and work hard and be workaholics and do all the stuff. And, and certainly we do have to work and we have to work hard and have a strong work ethic and all of that is true. But we can do all of that without the Lord's blessing. And the Bible says it's the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. But there are a lot of people and maybe you've done it yourself. We've done it ourselves. Well, we try to make ourselves rich by working really hard or by, you know, being, you know, industrious. But without the Lord's blessing on it, there is a little bit of sorrow because oftentimes people are workaholics. Oftentimes their marriages break up. Oftentimes they're working so much or gone so much or trying so hard to make a buck that they don't have a good relationship with their kids. And so in that respect, there is a price that brings sorrow. But the Lord has a better way. That's what we're trying to say. The Lord has a plan for you and I to prosper, to increase, to have abundance, so that we are blessed and can be generous. And it starts with, in large part, what we're gonna talk about today, okay? So today we're gonna to talk about the motive question. It's all the heart stuff. Why do we want to succeed? And we'll find out, and I think you know this already, but God is a God of the heart. You know, man looks at the outward, we look at appearance, we look at what people live in, drive, wear, we look at a lot of things externally, but God is a heart God and he looks at the heart. And in particular, when it comes to this subject, if we'll get our motives in the right place and if we'll have the right heart towards the Lord and towards his, his kingdom and other people, then we position ourselves to truly experience the blessings of God's economy, okay? So with that in mind, we're going to look at four things, okay? And we're going to talk about four things. We're going to start with our foundation, and it is a matter of the heart, as I mentioned. And we'll talk about it's a matter of contentment. It's a matter of greed and covetousness. We'll talk about that. And ultimately, it's a matter of purpose. It's sort of like the why behind the what, you know? And when those things are in alignment with God's word, like I said, you're positioned. You're so positioned to prosper. So get your Bibles or turn on your Bible if you use it on your digital device. Get your Bible, freshen up your cup of coffee, hit your DVR, and uh, get your pencil sharpened. Let's jump in to the scriptures. We're going to start with this whole idea, what do we love in our heart? And it's going to be contrasted. I think you can already figure out where we're going to go in this one. It's going to be contrasted with this idea that the Bible tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. So we know money's not evil, but it is the love of money that is evil. So then what are we supposed to love? If we don't love money, which we shouldn't, of course we should love God, but let's look at that from the word and see how changing what we love in our heart begins to position us for God's best, okay? So in Matthew, let's go there, of course, classic verse, Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. Another version says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But in terms of what do we love in our heart? I mean, first and foremost, we need to decide to love God more than anything else. Love God more than money. Love God with all of our strength, with all of our soul. That's our mind, our emotions, our will. And sometimes your will has to choose to make choices in light of loving God versus in light of loving self. 
So we love the Lord. Now, ultimately, and you guys have heard us talk about this. This is kind of a funny little dichotomy because in 1 John 4, it tells us it's not that we love the Lord. It's that he loved us. And that is true. Our response to God's love for us is that we love him. Okay. So, I mean, keep it in the right order. But at the end of the day, in our heart, because we know God loves us, Lord, I love you if I don't have anything. I love you if all I have is oxygen and I can take another step. Lord, I'm still going to love you. And we'll get to contentment in a minute. But it is this idea and it's a choice. It's not a feeling. I think sometimes people are waiting for the goosebump. Oh, well, I will love God when I feel, you know, when I feel that thing. But it's not really a thing you feel. I mean, you might. There might be occasions you really feel close to the Lord. There might be occasions where you really feel God's presence. But it's more of a decision that you make with your will. And it is a choice of the heart. And in a sense, you feel it. But it's not an emotional goosebump feeling. It's a heartfelt contentment, a satisfaction, a fulfillment. Like, I'm reconciled to God. God loves me. I love the Lord. And that actually becomes the satisfaction of your soul. And for some of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Others of you, you're like, what are you talking about? That God, that just loving God could be the satisfaction of your soul? might seem like a novel and like maybe unattainable thing, but it's not. It's, it's very attainable. And that's what God wants for all of us, that he does become our all in all. And then from that place, it's easy for the Lord to bless us with all kinds of things because now we're not loving those things. We're loving God. Are you catching that? And again, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but I just foundationally, it's a matter of the heart. Second thing that we're to love is we're to love God's word. And I think this is so important, especially in our culture these days, because so many people, as you guys know, globally are biblically illiterate. Like they're, they're not reading their Bibles. They're not turning on the Bibles on their phone. They're not listening to the scriptures. And so they don't know what they don't know. And the Bible says that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. So there is something about loving God's word. So let's take a look at Psalm 119. David, the psalmist, boy, did he ever love God's word. And if you ever want to stir yourself up in like, I don't love the word. I don't know if I love the Bible. I don't, I don't know if I have that. Listen, read Psalm 119. It's the longest Psalm in the whole Bible, but David loved God's word and that will be contagious and that will get on you as well. Listen to what he said in Psalm 119, verse 14. He said, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies, your word, as much as in all riches. In other words, he started to love God's word as if they were riches. That's how much we can love God's word because God's word's not just ink on a page. It's not just a book. These are living words. The Bible is living and active. It is called the living word of the living God. And in fact, I love what it says in Thessalonians. It says that God's word is effectually at work within us. Like, I think sometimes we need to re-esteem the power of this book. It's not like any other book on the planet. It is loaded with living words that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is still speaking to individual hearts in a customized way. He is still speaking his word, lifting them off the page and putting them right into our hearts, speaking them to us, customizing them for us. And boy, you start to experience that. You love this word, this book, more than anything else because it's life-giving. It's living. Remember what Jesus said? To Peter, all the disciples were going to quit following Jesus because Jesus had said some difficult things. And the disciples said, Lord, these are hard sayings. And Jesus really didn't bat an eye. He said to Peter and to the disciples, he says, well, do you guys want to leave too? A lot of my disciples have walked away. Do you guys want to leave too? And then Peter, I love it. Peter, he, you know, Peter said some really crazy things, but he said some amazing things. And he, Peter said this, he goes, well, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Think about that phrase. Jesus, where else are we going to go? Who else on planet earth, who else in the universe has words of eternal life? You're the only one that does. And Jesus has given us by the power of the Holy Spirit, these Bibles, his words, as well as the words he inspired the apostle Paul, the apostle John, Peter, and others to write, breathed, by God's breath so that you and I could love it. Well, David did, and I do, and I know you do, and I know all of us want to more. Listen to what else David said. He said, oh, how I love your law, your word. 
It is my meditation all the day. We'll talk about meditation later. I rejoice at your word, Psalm 119, 162. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. Verse 127, therefore, I love your commandments more than gold. Yes, then find gold. I mean, he's talking about treasures, about gold, and about riches, about wealth. Well, that's our topic. But yet he's saying, God, I don't even love those things. I love your word. I love you more than all of that. And so it's no wonder that God could say about David, man, he is a man after my own heart. He is the apple of my eye. It's no wonder David and the Lord had such a close relationship because David had that foundational stuff in the best place. He loved the Lord and he loved God's word. Amen. Can you catch that? Now the contrast is what I mentioned in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. This is, in what, this is the contrast. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, the love of what? Of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So anyways, we're just sort of setting that foundation today, talking about our motives. We love God. We love his word. We don't love money. Now, when we love God, we love his word. As it turns out, God blesses us with the ability to get wealth. And we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Mark 8, 36, Jesus said these words. He said, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Man, oh man, that hits me every time. You know why? Because on the news, every now and then, you know, we see someone famous, a celebrity or a wealthy person or somebody of high esteem has passed away. And I just heard about somebody the other day, a very successful, very um, admired person, a multi-billionaire. I mean, an incredibly successful person in the world's economy. And he just passed away at the age of 84. And you know what my first thought was? My first thought was, Lord, I hope he knew you. Like, where is he now? Yes, he gained all the wealth of the world. He profited in all the wealth of the world. But did he lose his soul? Y'all, eternity is a long time. And, I, and my heart, every time I'm like, Lord, I hope somebody, I hope a hospice person, I hope a nurse, I hope a family member, I hope somebody in his world shared the gospel with him. I hope he turned on the TV, turned on and found the basics with Beth, for all I know. I just hope somewhere along the way he heard the gospel because it is not worth it, y'all. It is not worth it to gain the whole world and be a workaholic and have kind of a disastrous life with a lot of money or even to have a great life with a lot of money and then lose your soul. Jesus is saying, the contrast. It's not worth it. What are we supposed to do? Love the Lord. Love his word. You catching, you catching that? Okay. Let's talk about another couple of things on this subject. Again, just foundationally, then you might say, okay, well then what do I do? What, what do I do if I, if I need to make some adjustments? Well, step one, if you've never done this, step one is to invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. I mean, that's where everything begins where Jesus is our Lord, right? And so we see in Romans 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, that's the great summary verse on salvation. How, how do I get saved? How do I come into this relationship with Jesus you're talking about? It's really simple. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, in other words, you say, Jesus, with your mouth, you say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. And in doing that, you're just transitioning yourself off from the throne of your life. And you're saying, Jesus, you be the Lord of my life. You sit on the throne of my life. You get behind the steering wheel. I confess with my mouth, you be my Lord. I'm making a ownership transfer here. You be the Lord of my life. And then it goes on to say, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, you believe in Jesus that he was raised from the dead. You confess with your mouth, Jesus, be my Lord. And then he becomes the Lord of your heart, the Lord of your life. And the Bible says you're saved. That's the beginning of this relationship with the Lord. And then from that point, you can get to know him. Just like anybody, isn't it true? Just like any relationship. I mean, when you first get to know somebody, they're, just, they're kind of an acquaintance. You might like them. You wouldn't maybe say, oh, I love them. You might just say, oh, I like them. They were nice. Like that, that was fun. And sometimes when you first meet the Lord, you know, especially those of you that are newer, 
you might be like, I don't know about this love thing. Like, I like the Lord. I'm glad I'm saved. I mean, yeah, yay. But the more you get to know somebody and the more time you spend and the more you talk and the more you listen and the more you laugh together and the more you walk together and the more you do stuff, the more love grows in your heart for that person. And it's no different with the Lord. The more time you spend with God and the more time you think about him and listen to his still small voice, guaranteed you're going to just love the Lord. And that's what he wants. And that's what you want as well. Amen. So we're taking a couple little rabbit trails today, but I think it's good. We've got to lay a foundation because there's no sense talking about, you know, increasing in your wealth, be generous if our foundation's not stable. Luke 6, 46, Jesus becomes the Lord of our lives and truly he becomes our Lord. He calls the shots. Jesus said, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard the word and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation. See, we're building a foundation today and giving you a chance to do it against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. What's the point? The point is we're all going to face storms. The point is we're all going to face winds and waves and storms of life. But the ones who are built on the rock of Jesus as Lord and the love for his word, doing his word, your house is going to stand. And it is true, you know, we'll all face even financial storms. There are things like recessions. There are things like people sometimes go bankrupt. Sometimes sales aren't great. I mean, there are seasons that can feel very much like this, but when Jesus is your foundation and you love him and his word, you'll stand, you'll be okay. You're going to weather whatever storm you're facing. Okay, finally, talking just about a matter of the heart, okay? And I love this verse, and there's so much we could uncover. This is in Proverbs 4.23. He says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring all the issues of life. Keep your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, because out of your heart flow or spring all the issues of life. So this is a really important, like basic principle, you know, foundational principle for life. God deals with us in our heart. Everything is from the heart. And the Bible tells us in 1 John, it, it says, and this is so amazing. He says, listen, if your heart doesn't condemn you, you have confidence before God. You can ask him for anything and he'll hear you. But if our hearts condemn us, we don't have any confidence before God. So like it is so critical to keep our hearts in a really good place with the Lord because even just our prayer life, even just our ability to have a confident relationship with the Lord is contingent on our hearts. Now the devil works overtime to cause us to feel guilt, unworthiness, inferiority, shame, insecurity in our heart, guilt, real guilt or false guilt, fear, anxiety, you name it. He tries to clutter up our hearts Think about your pipes, your water pipes at home. You ever had a, you ever had a clog in the pipes? You ever had a hairball <laughs> in the pipes? And you're like, what is going on? Things aren't flowing like they should. Well, it's because it's clogged. And the devil works overtime to clog the pipes of our heart and get us distracted and get us vexed and resent, resentful and in unforgiveness and anxious and fearful and you know, you name it. He's got a whole bag of tricks. That's why the Bible says, hey, you be on guard. You guard your own heart diligently. You just don't let any old thing into your heart. You don't just sign for every package that comes knocking on your heart. You go, no, I am guarding my heart with all diligence because I understand out of my heart flow, out of my heart, out of it, flow all the issues of life, every issue in life, relationships, your financial management and success, your relationship with the Lord, your success at work, your health, your emotional, mental health. I mean, everything in our lives flows from our heart. So our job is to do everything we're talking about here today, guard our hearts with all diligence. Okay, Lord, I'm going to guard my heart. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to guard my heart and make sure that the love of money doesn't overtake it. I'm going to make sure I don't start trusting in uncertain riches and be deceived by the deceitfulness of riches. Lord, that I stay in a place that I love your word more than gold. 
I love the wisdom I get from your word more than treasures. Lord, I love you with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul. I am guarding my heart because I know all the issues of the whole rest of my life, my marriage, my relationship with my kids. I mean, you could go down the list. I promise you, if you will give your heart attention, if you will guard it, if you'll take some of these scriptures we've talked about today and meditate on, my, on, on them in your own Bible, man, the Lord will strengthen your heart. You'll love the Lord. You'll love his word. And from that healthy place, that strong place, we can build on that to prosper in life and to be successful and to have increase in our income so that we can live this generous life. Amen. All right. Well, it was real basic today and very foundational, but I think it's, I think it's so important. So let me remind you, if you don't already have the book, please help yourself to it at thebasicswithbeth.tv. I'm hitting the high points. We're not getting into every verse, but I want you to. And, um, and take notes. I really want to encourage you to take notes every time and the DVR the program, underline the scriptures. And, um, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about as we meditate on these things, they become a part of our root structure. And then you're not like, oh, I'm trying so hard to be a Christian. No, I'm not really trying so hard. I just am a Christian. And it becomes easy to live this life we're talking about. Amen? Okay, so let's just wrap up with just a couple final thoughts, talking about some heart stuff. And these are such great classic verses, and I just want to make sure we, we hit them, okay? Psalm 1, it's the best. Psalm 1, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also does not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. This is describing the inner life of somebody who prospers and who has tapped into God's economy. And again, you can see it. he delights, he delights in God's word, loves God's word, loves the Lord, meditates in it. It's not just a side thing. It becomes the thing. And then Jesus reiterated these words, didn't he? In Matthew 6, Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves, treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Man, if our treasure is in God, and if we are cooperating with his economic flow, which we'll get into in future episodes, that's where our heart is. And then Jesus wrapped it up in verse 33. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these natural things that we need will be added to you. All right, so with all of that, can you see the foundation? Love the Lord, love his word. It's the foundation from which God helps us really get a grip on the basics of generous living. All right, so we're gonna hit pause here. I will see you next time right here on The Basics with Beth. Hey, thank you so much for joining us for today's program. And I wanna take just a minute to talk to you about this book, Getting a Grip on the Basics of generous living. And the reason why is because in this crazy, uncertain world we all live in, God's word is certain. And especially as it relates to our finances, especially as it relates to God's desire for you and I as believers to be blessed, to be a blessing, to be generous. And so in this book, we talk about all kinds of things, things like what is God's will as it relates to money? We answer some of the most common questions and misunderstandings when it comes to money. For example, when Jesus talked to the rich young ruler, you get the idea that maybe God's against people having money, but the whole context of scripture tells us a different story and we study it in detail in this book. The other thing that I love about what you'll get in this book is what's the difference, what's the big deal with God's economy and the difference between tithing offerings and giving alms to the poor. Three distinct ways of being generous, but what's the difference? And why does God want us to participate in his economy in those ways? And then what are the benefits to those we give to, but then also in return to our own lives as we are generous? So we cover all of that and a whole lot more. So I wanna encourage you to get your own copy of the book. Just go to thebasicswithbeth.tv. The other thing is, in addition to this book, we have lots of other books available for you to help you get a grip on the basics of the Bible, as well as our television program airs on all kinds of digital platforms, including smart TV like Roku, Apple TV, and others. 
And in addition to that, we have a podcast. We'd love for you just to drive in your car and listen to the podcast and let God's word strengthen your heart. And then finally, we have a whole online university with over a dozen courses for you to study God's word at your own pace, in your own space, and uh, it'll fill you with his grace. So I wanna encourage you to check out basicswithbeth.tv. All of it is there because we are on a mission to help you get a grip on the basics of the Bible because with that strong foundation in God's word, man, it'll set you up for a life of success. It'll set you up for what Jesus promised us when he said, I didn't come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came to give you life and life more abundantly. So check it out, thebasicswithbeth.tv. We are here to help you get a grip on the basics. Hey, before we go, we have one more thing to share with you. The Basics with Beth TV is now available on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Android TV. That means in addition to watching the broadcast right here on this network, now you can catch episodes of The Basics with Beth TV on demand whenever you want. Now you can get The Basics 24 seven. So we invite you to check out The Basics with Beth TV on whatever smart TV platform you have at home. And be sure to tell your friends. Thanks for watching today's show. We hope this message helped you to get the basics, live the life, and do the stuff. Be sure to set your DVR so that you never miss an episode. For more of The Basics with Beth Jones or to watch programs on demand, visit thebasicswithbeth.tv.